we're moving into our photosynthesis unit. Um, and before we get into the light reactions and the light independent reactions, I want to explore the overall reaction of photosynthesis. Talk about the reactants, talk about the products, what's necessary in order for photosynthesis to occur, and, and talk about the products of photosynthesis. So in order to, to do this, let's delve into the science behind photosynthesis. Let's look at what work was done in order to find out about these overall reactions. Let's talk about Van Helmont. 1634, we're going back to, to the 1700s, um, when Van Helmont did a, an experiment with a willow tree. It was a sapling, all right, and he wanted to grow the willow tree, so he set up a control experiment where he weighed the sapling. It weighed five pounds. He put it in 200 pounds of dirt, um, in, in the soil and, and let it grow for five years essentially. All he gave it was water. All right. After five years he found that the tree uh, it gained 164 pounds. All right. So he figured okay um, if the tree gained 164 pounds it makes sense that perhaps it robbed some of that matter from the dirt. So he weighed the dirt after those five years and found that the dirt had only lost two ounces. So this is somewhat puzzling for him. So where did all this matter? Where did this mass come from? Because all he gave it was water. So he figured, okay, water must f formulate, what must factor into this somehow. It must use that water to somehow turn it into tree stuff. And that tree stuff is some kind of generic carbohydrate. So the first two elements of the reaction of photosynthesis, Van Helmont found that water is necessary, and it somehow gets converted into some kind of generic tree matter, which is which is this um, generic carbohydrate, CH2O. We'll find later on that this is glucose. Moving forward, um, past Van Helmont, so we have this, we have water, we have this generic carbohydrate being produced. Let's go to Priestley, 1774. We're moving forward. He did an experiment, kind of uh, inhumane experiment, but we know that a candle cannot stay lit in a closed container, nor can a mouse stay alive in a closed container. So we put a mouse in a jar, close the jar, and the mouse does indeed suffocate. Well, if you put a plant in with the mouse, Priestley found that the, that, the, that the mouse doesn't expire, it stays alive. So this plant must produce some kind of life-giving gas, some kind of um, life-supporting gas, and we knew that, that that gas was indeed oxygen. So we can now add this into our equation. All right, we know, okay, so it must produce oxygen because it allowed this mouse to stay alive. And it's, these team seem to be self-sustaining, I'm sorry, in themselves, all right? So something that the mouse was respiring uh, was helping the plant as well. And, and the mouse exhales CO2, the plant uses it. Well, here we go. We've almost finished our overall equation. Van Helmont Priestley helped us fill these two blanks. We move on to Ingenau, 1772. He found that in the presence of light, plants release oxygen. So plants need water. They need carbon dioxide. In the presence of light, we'll light, write light over this reaction arrow. We'll make this carbohydrate and oxygen. There is our overall unbalanced reaction of photosynthesis. Staying with the theme of light, Engelman in 1883 did some more research on light and he found that certain wavelengths of light were more effective for photosynthesis than others. Now how can you measure um, the rate of photosynthesis? Well, he found that, that measuring the rate of oxygen release showed you how well or how effectively photosynthesis was happening. If there was a great deal of oxygen being released, photosynthesis was happening very rapidly and very successfully. So we took an algae, which was a, a filamentous algae, very long-bodied algae, and he took a, a source of white light and ran it through a prism. 
And so we splayed out all of these different wavelengths of visible light across the, bo the body of, of these filamentous algae. He also put in, in, in this system an aerobic bacteria. And recall that an aerobic bacteria is a bacteria that likes oxygen, that needs oxygen in order to survive. So in this system, it would make sense that these bacteria would congregate where oxygen is at a highest concentration. And where is, where is oxygen going to be at the highest concentration? It's going to be where photosynthesis is happening most rapidly. So if you look at all of these wavelengths of light going from the, the colors of the rainbow from Roy G. Bibb, um, he found that the bacteria congregated in the violets and blues and over here in the reds and oranges, that very few of them um, were in the areas of green light. So this must mean that not only is light useful and necessary for photosynthesis, but plants um, prefer certain wavelengths over others. They prefer wavelengths in this range and this range over green. And that makes sense because um, we know that many or most plants are green. They're, they're, they're not utilizing those wavelengths of light or else we wouldn't see them. Okay, They're being reflected back to us they're not being utilized. So we've got light, a little bit more about light from Engelman. And we have our overall reaction. It was thought early on that in order to get the oxygen that's released, okay, it seemed kind of intuitive that the CO2 splits. Okay, so here's our oxygen being released as atmospheric molecular oxygen. This carbon then um, comes over, okay, bonds to the water, and there we have it. There's our, our, our carbohydrate. Well, Van Neel uh, worked with bacterium that used sulfur compounds. They used a hydrogen sulfide in their metabolism as a food source. And what he found, and if you look at these two uh, reactions, they're very similar. Okay, we have CO2, CO2, H2O. Over here, these bacteria used H2S. Okay, these extremophiles used a sulfur compound. They produced a, a carbohydrate okay, and, and, and sulfur, okay, elemental sulfur. Now, here's how they did it. The only way that this sulfur could, can become free was if the H2S splits. All right, and then the CO2 was then utilized to make this carbohydrate. Well, it was then found that a very similar mechanism happens in photosynthesis. Rather than CO2 splitting, all right, the water splits. That water splits, and this is going to be very, very important when we talk about the light reactions. But now it was no longer thought CO2 splits. Um, Van Neel helped to clarify that it's indeed water splitting to release it's essentially a waste product, a very, very useful waste product but a waste product in this system nonetheless, oxygen. So there's some of the science behind this whole process. We're going to get more in depth into the light reactions and the Calvin cycle in the, in the coming screencasts.